Hi, I'm Noam Wasserman, Dean of the Sci Sim School of Business at Yeshiva University. I was a longtime professor at Harvard Business School, an entrepreneur, and a venture capitalist. I wrote the bestseller, The Founder's Dilemmas. And I'm Charlie Harari. I've been working with companies for over 10 years. And that book, Founder's Dilemmas, and the challenges faced by the 10,000 founders in it is the basis of this podcast. We are delving into the issues faced by startups to help you avoid the pitfalls that claim so many good companies. Let's get started. Okay, everybody, welcome back to Founders Podcast, Founders Dilemmas Podcast. It's an honor to be with you again. Uh, we are here learning more about the entire journey of the founders. We're here with Dean Noam Wasserman. Dean, what have you have for us today? So, thank you, Charlie. Great to see you. It's uh, uh, you're referring to the entire journey as uh, appropriate for today's episode. We're gonna have a lot more episodes coming up, but. Uh, we're going to put a capstone in some ways on this first pass through the life cycle of the venture. We started off with pre-founding, so before you even decide to be able to leap into it and how to think through that, then we've gone through each stage of the journey of being able to get launch, lift off, scaling, all the other pieces of it. Today, we are going to get to the finish line. Today, we're going to be talking about exits and a couple of different flavors of it, all sorts of ways in which you have to plant some of the seeds very early on for you to increase the chances of getting to an exit that you're going to celebrate. Um, and that's what we're going to delve into today in a couple of different ways and a tap both a little bit on data and also tap some stories of founders who faced uh, dilemmas that are exit dilemmas. Um, so first off, let's start off with a little bit of data. So Charlie, you, when you read in the newspaper, how often do you see a company going public versus a company selling itself to another one? Which one gets all the headlines? Which one gets the attention? For sure, the public. You get to you get to clap at the stock exchange. Who doesn't want that? Okay, no, that's a classic example. With that, uh, we actually just had one of our Sci Sims grads from 1992, a woman named Julie Fetter, who as CFO led her company to ringing the bell on the Nasdaq. You know, Great. going public um, under her leadership with the help of the CEO and everything else like that. Great pictures of it. That's the headlines. Uh, Times Square. That's where you show up on the big billboard. Uh, as they're publicizing it. So yes, that is what gets all the attention. How often do you think that is compared to what the actual exit is of an, an acquisition? I think it's a fraction. So it's actually a tiny fraction. Only 3% of the exits are going public, are ringing right. the bell, are being you know up on Times Square. 97%, if you are able to exit, there's also the all the ones who are not able to even get to either of these, but 97% are by our acquisitions getting sold. Um, one of the big differences is how big are each of those, uh, how big are each of those exits? How, what is the value at the, each of those points? And that's where the attention actually maps to it. Um, the, this is from PitchBook data from a few years ago. Um, the value of an IPO on average um, is about 686 million. The value of an acquisition is 114 million. So about six X. Uh, the amount when you are going public. So in some ways it's deservedly big, but in terms of it being the rare outlier, in terms of it being very much the path less taken, IPO does not deserve <laughs> that same at attention as what it gets compared to selling your company, being able to have a nice life, uh, being able to you know walk away with a, a good paycheck for what you've been able to do, the hard work that you put into it. So let's start off first with the very prominent one of these options, and then we'll get into the 97% of the options. Um, my favorite one around this uh, that I teach within my Founders Dilemmas course, a uh, case study um, that, <clears throat> that I like to be able to introduce the students to the exits and also a bunch of the tensions that founders face when they're doing this um, is about the founder of Nike. Uh, Phil Knight was the founder of Nike. Um, the fun title that we were able to use for that case because it comes through pretty clearly in the case is Knight the King. Uh, very much a control-oriented founder. Um, lots of the decisions that he did when uh, he was growing it, growing Nike. We're very much mapping to a lot of things we talked about, about control-oriented types of things they would do, building it over a couple of decades, you know, very steady ways in which he was founding it. Um, <clears throat> would you say that a king, someone who wants control, should go public? Is that something no that he way. should do? Why no not? Because you, you lose all control. You now are, are subject to the whim of the publics. They, 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 they expect differently from you. They don't expect long-term growth. They favor short-term gains. You have to disclose everything. Your whole life changes. I was, you know, I began my, my, my career, my non-law career, my post-law career in a public company, in a public real estate shop. Um, and then we went private. 
and the difference between being public and private, it's like, it's two different companies, although we did the same stuff. Okay, what would be your biggest worry about losing control if you were Phil Knight and you want, we were going public? You, you can't, you, you won't be able to control the future of the strategy of your organization. First of all, you could potentially be a takeover target, but that's a different story, right? Even just Wall Street's expectations of you, even just the impact of the stock, you are, you are so much in the whim of so many others that when you make hard, difficult, sometimes controversial decisions that you, because of your position, know they're right for the long term of the company, that gets, that gets penalized in public markets many times. Okay, so absolutely the ways in which the loss of control, the strategic decisions, other things like that that you're gonna be losing, highlights the central role that the board of directors is gonna be playing and in a public company where you have all sorts of other representatives on the board who were not handpicked by you. You know, the, right. you, you have no idea who's gonna be buying your shares on the public market. Which of the big mutual funds is gonna be demanding a seat on the board of directors? Yeah. You know, Which a bunch of, the of the other- Investors are gonna come in there and try to make your company better and throw you out. Exactly. And so early on, Phil Knight tried to go public and failed at doing it. And to me, it was the biggest blessing. It was the biggest bracha for him because he would have had all of these things that you were talking about losing control of the strategic direction and the vision, possibly even getting fired by the board when he is disagreeing with them or the strategic or any of the other ways in which you're looking at his capabilities and deciding that that's not how he should be doing it. A decade later, he decided to take a second crack having learned the lessons from that. And he was very different at that point. What he did was he structured something and there's a lot of recent companies that have done this. People think it's a recent development, but actually Nike was an early practitioner of it. He was able to have a lot of the bargaining power be strong enough because Nike had grown over that decade that he was able to create dual class shares. He was able to have, not that it's plain vanilla, I am selling a bunch of things on the public market and everyone has the same vote as I do for every class, for every share that I have and for every share that they do. He was able to create super voting founder shares. And what that meant was when he was starting to go public, he was actually gonna have not a controlling interest of the company. He was gonna be going under 50% of it. By having this dual class shares, he was able to create something that after the IPO, he actually strengthened his control of the board compared to what he had before. He actually had about 85% control over the board compared to less than half of the control that he would have over the board if he had not gone public with it. And so that's one of the few conditions. You have the bargaining power in your hands you get your company to the point where it is a hot commodity, where people are willing to buy it, even though you're going to ha- be susceptible. It's a, to me, a classic line about uh, monarchy is the greatest of the models out there for ruling, as long as the monarch is infallible. You are betting on Phil Knight, you know, making all the right calls if he is the one who's controlling all of this. Right. And so, because of that, that's why there's a lot of ways in which um, the public markets are very hesitant be able to do it. But when you have your company hitting on all cylinders, pioneering and dominating his industry and other ways in which it's going to be able to be a very different uh, commodity and very attractive as a stock compared to a decade before when he failed to go public, that was he was able to be able to line all of those things, to be able to have a lot more control come out of it. And mm-hmm. since then, we've seen a lot of high flying tech companies go beyond all sorts of ways. The ratio that <clears throat> Phil Knight had um, Groupon when it went public, 150 to one was the ratio of what the founder was able to have of a vote compared to what the people who didn't have the founding shares. Zynga, 70 to one. Um, Both of those got very hit hard after they debuted because the founders are not infallible. And so all sorts of ways in which they paid a real price and it made people think twice about it. Uh, Theranos, you know, one of the highest flying companies of the last decade or so, uh, revolutionizing healthcare and blood testing and other things like that. Elizabeth Holmes, the founder CEO, on lots of magazine covers and other things like that. Um, she was able to have 100 to one uh, votes to share in terms of the control over there. Final example within this realm, <clears throat> excuse me, the Snap, which was one of another one of the high flying tech companies, consumer uh, companies that was out there. They offered zero votes to new investors. Hmm. Essentially, they were saying, you know, you uh, will in. just be right. buying into the economics and not having any way to be able to protect your investment or anything like that. Um, and so that one that led to all sorts of trouble on the market, they, they got their wrist slapped and other things like that. 
Um, but that was where they took it to an extreme in terms of being able to have the control around that. And that's where we have to think of it through the lens of rich versus king, all sorts of ways in which um, the infallible monarch is going to have un unchecked uh, monarchy and other things like that. Um, some of the other things to be thinking about when you're looking at IPOs as investors and also as a founder, being able to evaluate whether this is a good exit for you. So that's the first of the exit possibilities that we are taking a look at about being able to go public and some of the ins and outs of some of the people who have gone and done that. And it applies also in, for private investment. I mean, there are plenty of people <laughs> that um, as they as they get a new investment, it changes their ability to make decisions as well. You know, even if it's if it's private capital or however they they invest. This idea of as you take on more capital, whether it's public money or private money, what does it do to your your investment decisions? You know, there are there are companies that start to raise funds, and in in the fund structures, start to do their their transactions through the funds, and have investment committees and have reporting up and have a whole new world of of bosses, if you will, along the way up. And I think that's a very important decision to really think through, and people don't think through it enough, which is if you're not leaving, if you're still going to somehow manage this business, what is the cost of the capital, not in economic terms, but in decision-making terms? Yeah, no, a lot of times always think about, you know, the percentage that you own is a financial thing, right. but the percentage that you own has control implications and especially when it comes to the seats on the board of directors, the key decision-making body, um, all sorts of echoes that we can see throughout the evolution of a venture and the ways it's going to be affecting whether you can stay CEO and whether you can even exit. Like a, the board might be disagreeing with you. The founder might want to keep going independently, not go public. And the board might be saying, no, we want to be able to put yeah. some points on the board and be able to cash out our money and be able to show our limited partners. You know, uh, we're raising our own fund, You know, the, the next fund. This next time around, we have to be able to show the limited partners that we've returned to them. All sorts of other things that are going to conflict with the founder's interest, and it's going to come to a head, possibly all the way at the finish line, that they're going to be diverging from their investors. Yeah, yeah, I think that's an important thing, and, and as founders, you really have to consider that, and especially in, in the evolution of a business, when a business hits hard times and needs cash to operate, there are some, a bunch of founders that are scared to actually get anyone's capital because they're scared to give up any decision making and they put their business at peril because there's not enough cash to get through a recession or to get through a, a market change. And so as a result, because they don't fully get it, they live in zero, they live in, in, in black and white. And so they go, I can't give up anything. They don't realize that if you just think through, and I think the Phil Knight concept is a brilliant concept that think through the idea of separating economic interest and decision-making interest and how do you negotiate both. You know, an interesting phenomenon taking place in the market now is retail capital. And a lot of companies, like especially real, real estate companies, are, are choosing to go to some of the, the, the wirehouses and some of the big platforms um, like a JP Morgan or whatever in order to sell through the retail channel money uh shares or, or opportunities to raise money through that and they're doing it in part because these are small-time investors these are going into financial advisors and going in different books across the world versus going to a bunch of institutions and that's important for their decision making abilities they don't want to be beholden to, to a few institutions they want to actually have lots and lots and lots of small investors and so while it's a huge initial um expense and investment of time over time, it play it, it it pays because you it allows you to keep control while raising the money. So it's an yeah. important distinction to know the difference. No, exactly right. This is in some ways how the growth over the last decade or so of new options for founders uh, for financing enables them to sometimes be able to strike a different trade off when it comes to the rich versus kings things that we've been taking a look at. Um, yeah. It doesn't enable them to eliminate them, but enables them to have a couple of other options to be able to strike a different balance. Uh, than what they've had before. So you're exactly right. It sometimes is at the exits that we're talking about or every round of financing, every way that they have now, other options that they didn't have in, back when Phil Knight was doing his stuff in the 70s and 80s. Um, that's just some of the other things that they have as options now. Yep. Okay, so heading into the other one, the 97% of the, the things with the, the sales, um, let's take a look at a couple of other founders. Um, this is Tom and Tom. Tom and Tom were the founders of Nantucket Nectars. Uh, became a major player in drinks and the um, <clears throat> you know, being able to walk into the um, into the into the supermarket, being able to grab a drink, being able to be in uh, a restaurant, being able to have an Nantucket Nectars as what you're going to order with your burger and other things like that. Tom and Tom built the company, and then uh, this is actually the capstone to the founders' dilemmas course. 
one of the things that I have fun with with them is that I, we ask first with the students, we give them lots of data on their performance, and we ask, how much are you willing to accept as Tom and Tom for the company? One of the critical things about what is your price that you'd be willing to say, yes, I'll sell my baby for that. And so they'll go and crunch all the numbers, they'll come up with their analyses and other things like that. I'll start off class asking, what is the most critical number that Tom and Tom are facing right now? And they'll try to guess at certain things, stuff like that. In the end, I will say one versus three. Do you have only one offer of an acquirer wanting to go and acquire your company? Or as Tom and Tom did, they had three acquirers after them. Mm -hmm. You have no bargaining power if you are a price taker with only a single offer. Absolutely. Same thing Pops for a down. founder in a financing round. You only get one term sheet. You're desperate for money. Are you going to take it? Well, you don't really have a way to push back. You're, you're at their mercy. You have three mm -hmm. term sheets. You have three investors who are coming for you. All sorts of bargaining power that is now shifted into your hands. And so no matter how much we crunch the numbers, no matter how much we uh, go and analyze and things like that, the bargaining power of developing your company into something that is going to be valuable enough of your being able to have it be something that is attractive to multiple acquirers for them. It was Pepsi, Ocean Spray, and a major private inve equity investor. You, know, you have them competing for right. you. You have all sorts of degrees that you can be able to keep pushing the terms to your favor um, compared to the person who only has a price taker and has a single one. What, one of the mistakes I think people make is that they wait for acquirers. And I think the point here is that whenever there's interest in your business, you can use it to go out and seek acquirers. And I'll give you a great example. Um, in 2008, the, the, I think they call him the grandfather of real estate, Sam Zell, was looking to sell Equity One, his massive conglomerate real estate company. And Steve Schwartzman of Blackstone, I think offered him, I think it was like $42 a share. And as opposed to selling, which would have made an incredible profit for him, he, he actually put it on the market to some extent. And Vernado bid, which sparked the bidding war. And I believe his final number was 55 and a quarter. And he <clears throat> understood that if Steve Schwartzman is coming after his business, there's something valuable here that he's not paying attention to. He later figured out that what Steve Schwartzman was going to do was buy his business and then sell off the most valuable assets and keep the others. And they actually, I think that's what actually happened in Blackstone. But if Blackstone's after your business, your business is valuable. And if they're offering $40 a share, you can be sure it's not worth $40 a share. So when, you're in a, when you have a company and there's people that want you, that means that there's someone pretty smart that sees something in you and where a lot of founders they don't realize they're so they're so they're so smitten that they're like this is great yes and they don't pull back and go wait a second what do they see in me that i don't see in myself should i expand my searching and maybe make some 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 entries into the into the market to see if there's other people that are interested if for nothing else there's probably more value you can find that that is not being manifest in that first offer yeah, no, absolutely. So I think, let me give you some numbers on what you're talking about. This isn't from my data set, but this is from class. So when I would ask my students, they'd done all the number crunching, the prep and things like that. I asked them, how much would you bid for Nantucket Nectars if you were the only bidder versus how much would you bid if you knew that there were two other bidders besides you? And uh, the premium would be 55% higher on average than the yeah. students doing that. So very much the case that if you can get it be an auction dynamic, um, it's going to be very different than the price taking dynamic, but yeah. there's also one other dimension. So you were focusing Charlie on the financial side of how the founders can get it better for them. What Tom and Tom were able to do was also get it better for them on the control side. I'm sure. Yeah. They were able to negotiate things around maintaining the company culture around their involvement in the venture being what they wanted it to be and other things like that. And if you're a price taker, it's also going to affect not just the financial, but also the control. And you can be able to have a very different path that you can plot for yourself on both dimensions of Rich and King, uh, if you're able to be able to stack the deck and be able to have them coming after you instead. Yeah, absolutely. That's exactly so right. So in terms of the reasons why they decided to sell, there were both strategic reasons and also personal ones. And for me, as always, the personal are the more intriguing ones, but uh, strategic reasons, they had their original investor, had been an angel investor, had been not familiar with the industry and other things like that. And they decided that there could be more potential gained by trading in that financial partner for a juice partner. 
be able to get more per, more purchasing strength, production expertise, like other things like that. And so yep. strategic ways in which they might be able to grow a more valuable company by teaming up with another one of those acquirers that also affect their view of take a private equity person onto the board and as the investor versus get a Pepsi, get an ocean spray around that. But also on the personal reasons, um, this is Tom First, uh, one of the two Toms. Um, the great quote, uh, let, me, uh, let me quote you from this. Uh, when he came to class and was visiting, um, he said that it is so hard to climb that mountain as a founder building the venture. When you get there, you're excited, but you're also scared. We've worked so hard to get here. What if we fail? What if we don't get everything back that we put in and end up going in reverse? So essentially we overstay our welcome and we over commit and we, uh, we are able to, we have a less valuable company because of that. There's certainly a combination of fatigue and fear that was entering into our decision to be able to make that. He actually had a great metaphor for them and their perspective on themselves. So the self-awareness piece uh, that we've talked about multiple times, taking a metaphor from their industry, uh, Tom said, we have a shelf life too. Hmm. We are hitting our expiration date on being Very able cool. to lead the company up this mountain, being able to add value to it and things like that. And at that point, there was the need to maybe move to multi-serve, be able to go from the restaurant market into the uh, into supermarkets and other things like that. He thought it was too big for them to lead into the multi-serve, not anything that they knew and a very different set of contacts and other things like that. And so that was the first of the things in terms of what's going on in the founder's head about why to exit. The fatigue, the fear, the worry that you're going to de decrease the value of the company uh, by sticking around for too long and other things like that. The second of the personal ones actually came from the other of the Toms. Um, and actually begs the question of what does monetary success mean? And so this gets into, for me, it brought back to mind um, from Ethics of the Fathers, uh, from Pirkei Avot, uh, Ben Zoma, um, at the beginning of the fourth chapter, Ezehu Asher HaSamech Bechelko. Who is rich? He's the one who's going to be happy with, uh, with what he's going to earn. What Tom highlighted is that he had seen a bunch of prior founders um, who uh, they would set a number for themselves of when they would exit, and then as soon as the company got close to that value, they would reset their expectations higher. That's not enough. We have to keep being able to get more and more and more around that. And so they decided to set a number of what monetary success would mean to them. And it got into it in some ways where that, that other time, very interesting um, uh, about thinking ahead to what's enough um, because you'll be raising that bars, get closer and closer. When it came to for the, the other time for Tom Scott, what did he set it at that he said that I want to be at least, and this gets into a lot of the family dynamics, I want to have a net worth at least as much as my father. Hmm. How much does father have? Uh, so uh, whatever the amount was, he wanted to have that plus a dollar as being as what he was setting. How's that, How's that for a... We're not going to get into that. That's a, there's another podcast about that dynamic. I think it's, it's a, exactly. A the intergenerational the family dynamic yeah, yeah. around that. Um, and, but it's but a great very, concept, though. It's a great exactly. concept. I find it. I find it even with people that are working in companies that are constantly unhappy, and the reason is because they don't know how much they want to make. Um, this this had a you know a friend of mine founded a company years ago, sold it, and gave his executives um, a big bonus, and they were like beyond themselves. They were they were they were in tears until they found out how much he got for the venture. And then they were livid, right? And th this idea of what's right for me, what what should what should I make, right? It, it, if you don't have some sense of a goal of what you're going after, and the money is like I want to be anywhere between where I am now and Jeff Bezos, like you're never satisfied. You're never, and you end up chasing and chasing and chasing. It's like it's like a gambler. You end up betting and betting and betting and betting until like you know like you said you know your your either your value or your company achieves its shelf life um yeah. another thing that i, I just want to point out here and we, we did this in an earlier episode on the serial entrepreneur um this incredible trait of self-awareness and i think the more we study these people the more we realize that there's a certain you mentioned this earlier as well there's a certain humility and if it's not humility at least it's 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 raw uh, uh, it's a commitment to truth that great founders have. They know when they're going to be done. They know when their company's going to expire. They don't put their head in the sand and say, we'll always need horses. It's crazy. Cars will never make it, right? They're, they're constantly in a space where they're watching the world change and they're not, 
stuck on yesterday. And you see it even the story here of Tom and Tom, where they're they're watching their own company, and they're 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 sort of looking for when they'll expire, when their shelf, and that's that's a critical, in, incredible step that has the same feeling as the founder who says, I can't do this, I need someone else. It's that same self-awareness and humility that, you know, as they say in, in, in Torah, Hakolzman Vaes, that everything has a time and a place and your time may come and then may leave, you gotta know, right? And to even circle back to one other earlier episode um, about the podcasting, right? There was a moment where the, the founder realizes this is the moment. So either, whether the wave's up or the wave's down, just being aware of that is, I think, a critical piece of, of this growth. Yeah, no, absolutely. The Tom and Tom story, though, adds on another piece to what we're talking about here, about having to be on the same page about this. Yeah. As it turns out, when Tom and Tom would come to class, visit my class, and they would talk, it would be the two of them there. One of the times, Tom, Tom Scott was not able to come, and Tom first came on his own. And in that class, he admitted that he would have preferred to not exit he would prefer to raise new money. He would prefer to bring on a new CEO who would be able to extend the shelf life and go in that very different direction from it. But because Tom Scott was very dedicated to getting his number, to moving on with his career, the, the next stages and other things like that, um, uh, that's where they actually weren't on the same page and Tom first had some, uh, some regrets from it. But this also takes us back around to where we started as a framework of how to think through whether you want to exit. How can you decide whether you want to remain independent, whether you want to exit and other things like that? Um, and so uh, we can give a little bit more of a structured way by where we started this whole journey that we've gone through. If you think about our three circles that we started off with about deciding when you want to inject yourself into the venture, those three considerations also are when you want to subtract yourself from the venture. And so when you take a look at the business considerations, the career considerations, the personal considerations, um, it's very possible that the market has changed. It is no longer as attractive for you as what it had been. Maybe now it's time to exit. Career-wise, you've learned about yourself that I am a starter. I wanna go and make a multi-venture career out of what I'm doing. Maybe I should move on and head on to the next stage of now being a starter rather than continuing in the, um, the autopilot that is the, early, the, the later days of the venture. Personal circumstances, that's actually where it has changed a little bit for Tom first. He now actually had a daughter who had been born to him after I think being single when they had started Nantucket Nectars. He was worried about his legacy. If we sell to Pepsi, our, is the Nantucket Nectars name gonna go away? Is it gonna get swallowed up by the big one? He said, is my daughter gonna know what I built? Very pointed about it. He talked about being able to walk into a supermarket, hold up a bottle and say to his daughter, this was me. I was the one who put that there or did it get wiped away in a corporate change and other things like that. And so some very personal things on the, the three circles that give you some idea about what do you want to change. This also brings me to my favorite quote about exits, but it also happens to wrap around to where we started as we uh, bring this to a, uh, to a close here. Um, this is from Shakespeare. And this is, uh, this is from uh, um, As You Like It. Uh, this is from the second chapter of that. All the world's a stage, and all the men and women merely players. They have their exits and their entrances. And one of the key things that I love about this is that it puts exits before entrance. Essentially, we've talked throughout about how you have to think down the road. You have to have the foresight of where things are likely to go. And then once you decide where you're going to celebrate in the end, what are the ways in which that end point should then inform the early decisions that you make? I happen to love that Shakespeare put the exits before the entrances. Try to proactively anticipate from the beginning. What are you going to celebrate at the end of the day? Tom and Tom, very different things that they were going to be celebrating. Uh, Phil Knight, we talked about you know being able to think through that ahead of time. Being able to make the right decisions early on that will reinforce the chances you're going to get to that end point is a critical thing that Shakespeare is highlighting for us. And so in some ways, uh, the end of the life cycle, highlighting for us the importance of the beginning of the life cycle and making the pre-founding foundation building moves that are gonna enable you to start off right. And then the key things along the way of being able to keep your eye on the ending point and making the interim decisions that'll help you be able to get to there. Wow, unbelievable. Wow, this has been quite quite a journey for those who have been joining us now. Check out the past few episodes where really has, it's all been strung together. Coming up next, um, we're going to have some Q&A, so check check out the next episode that's going to be dropping, in which we'll get some Q&A going. And I believe if you want to send a question, it's foundersdilemmaspodcast at gmail.com. 
Did I get that right? Founders Dilemmas Podcast at gmail.com. Always feel free to send us your comments, your suggestions, um, and your questions. We look forward to answering them as well. Dean, thanks so much for the time, and we can't wait to see you next time. Likewise. Thank <laughs> you.